Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and when is enough enough? Today, we'll hear the story of one woman who learned the hard way that millions in your bank account doesn't equal more living in your life. The queen of money zen, Manisha Takor. And speaking of millions, in our headlines, we'll answer the question, what does a $5 million retirement look like? Maybe not what you'd expect. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky stacking Benjamin's listener, and I'll share some transformative trivia. And now, two guys who almost have enough, it's Joe. Oh, and oh, j j j j g Hey there, stackers. You made it to the middle of the week, so relax. Put your feet up and get ready for an hour of money fun. I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me, it's the man, the myth, the legend, OG. What's happening? Well, you know, we, we made it's it to Wednesday. halfway, dude. We, uh, as people listen to this, we, you and I are at Podcast Movement, getting our podcasting nerdery on. I'm going to get a yeah. massage. <laughs> that's, I keep on getting these emails from the, from the hotel that's like, you know, hey, uh, did you get your spa package? I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe I should get one of these. <laughs> keep out for it. Right. So I'm going to take, take yours, too. As soon as you said we're getting our podcast nerdery on, I thought, nope, OG's at the bar right now. <laughs> and Joe is it's, going booth to booth to booth to booth, talking to everybody there's, who's there's in somebody the, sitting at the bar the at 10 a.m. You can't one of know us, who it might be. One of us is getting our podcast nerdery on. The other one's drunk by 11. Just uh, ready. <laughs> I'm just there so I don't get fined. <laughs> just that right. normal Wednesday. <laughs> ready to go. Well, speaking of normal Wednesday, we've got a fantastic. Uh, storyteller on today. Manisha Takor has a whole brand called Money Zen because she learned the hard way, OG, that uh, that she had to breathe, that she had to she had to figure out that, uh, you know what, more spelled M-O-A-R, more is it's mm. not necessarily better. But before that, we got a great headline. But before even that, have you ever noticed that uh, that as we go from August into September, some uh, some weird stuff starts happening. Like what? Well, like, well, that's not that weird. Maybe this will be weird. No, then again, that wasn't that weird either. OG, sorry about that. No, let's right. let's continue. Maybe we do need to learn how to podcast. Good thing is people listen to this. We're learning what the hell we're doing. Let's get this show rolling. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from uh, a guy named Dr. Bill who sent this. Thanks, Dr. Bill, for saying, hey, I think this Wall Street Journal piece would be great to talk about. (laughs) That is Mr. Bill. Oh, is that the wrong one? I didn't even think about that. Oh, no, we got a we got a piece of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, This this story. (laughs) It's you written you by, do that falsetto really well, Joe. Why is show's that? show's already so far off the rails. Do you People have just one like, testicle? <laughs> What's happening? I have no idea. Story's written by our friend Veronica Dagger over at the Journal. Here's what a $5 million retirement looks like in America. Did you see this piece, OG? Yeah. Yep, I read it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Veronica writes, no amount of money can make retirement worry-free, but $5 million might come close. What's that joke that, you know, you can't, uh, money won't solve all your problems, but it sure is more fun to pull up to them in a Lamborghini. It's nice to arrive to them in a, in a limo. Live a limousine, yeah. yeah. Few Americans manage to save anywhere near that sum in their 401ks and individual retirement accounts. A $5 million NASDAQ puts you in the top 0.1% of households, according to an Employee Benefit Research Institute analysis of retirement accounts using the 2019 Survey of Consumer Finances. To find out what $5 million buys in retirement, we spoke to retirees around the country with savings in that ballpark. Do you think, OG, most of these people thought they would be millionaires or not? No. No, the, com- the, the, the common theme with people who have accumulated a whole bunch of money is, is that they didn't think that it would be uh, possible 
by doing the little bits that they had to do over the over their lifetime of doing it. Yeah, they did not do anything super sexy to get there. I think it's important to note that a lot of people think that that top 0.1% of people, you know, they use some really sexy investment scheme. They've got these investments that only the few can get. And yet that wasn't the case for most of these people. Yeah. Simple wins. But what, what I did find interesting was, was that while people did a great job of saving, there was one thing that they, they did commonly, and that was a lot of them used stocks. Uh, there's a gentleman in here, uh, Paul Shemwell. He retired in December. In fact, it's funny, Veronica wrote, he landed in retirement after four decades flying commercial planes and jet fighters. He landed. So good. Let's see what he did there. Yes. Uh, though the 65 year old feels financially secure with about 6.1 million socked away. He hasn't mapped out a flight plan. Hasn't mapped out a flight plan for what comes next. What he did do 95% of his portfolio OG in stocks, mostly in index funds, a few individual equities like Apple, but, but not a ton. Uh, Apple, if he's only has 5% of his money in Apple, that's not what made him the 6.1 millionaire. It was saving it and letting it, uh, letting it compound this miracle compounding is fantastic. i mean to be fair you know some some of the to not look at it in, ter in terms of the career choice also you know has something to do with it right i mean sure so you know being an airline pilot a a, a big you know uh legacy carrier airline pilot comes with a lot of perks and a lot of financial benefits now there's some downsides to it too he mentions in that article that uh He's divorced. So there's that, you know, so, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of time away from home, but, but, um, uh, so some of it has to do with that, but, but the largest success rate or the largest uh, factor for success, as I should say, is investing early and often and then not touching it. I mean, the thing is, is that when it comes to equity investing, it's the only thing that outpaces inflation. Uh, it's the only thing that that provides you with that compounding return. And it seems impossible. Like you can't, you can't do compounding in your brain. It just doesn't, does the math doesn't check out. But, but when you, you know, when you see it in action and you see the success rates or you see how, how people have done it, it's just like, it's just like the recipe card. You just have to do the things that the other people have done to be successful. And there's no real shortcut. I mean, you're talking about like sexy investments and that sort of thing. People do those esoteric things or Wall Street bets or whatever, you know, uh, uh, trading strategies and things like that because you feel behind. You know, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm 45. I haven't done hardly anything. I need to catch up. So therefore, I need to, you know, swing for the, f you know, the fences on every pitch. You don't have to. The power of compounding will work magically over the next 25 years. You just have to let it. Don't interrupt it. Yeah, there's a great uh, rule uh, called the Rule of 72, which I think a lot of our stackers have heard about, but maybe, oh, gee, some, some haven't. You take the interest rate you think you're going to get, divide it into 72, and let's say somebody did a really great job of saving, and by the time they're 30, they've accumulated, let's say, $200,000. Yeah. They're like, wow, to get to $5 million, I got a long way to go. Well, you probably don't. If you think you're going to get an 8% rate of return... Take eight divided into 72. That means every nine years, your money's going to double. So by the time you're 39, it doubles once. Uh, 48, it doubles again. 57, it doubles the third time. And then we'll go 66 for a fourth time. That, that 200,000 you've already saved by the time you're 30, the first double of those four makes 400,000. Second double means it's 800,000. 1.6 million, four doubles, $3.2 million by the time you're 66 years old. You're, you're already, you're already almost in this piece <laughs> yeah. by the time you're 30. Yeah, and you haven't saved anything else. That does, that's not assuming that you continue to save over those, or, you know, over that, over, over, over those years, right? That's, I get to 30 with 200 grand or I get to 40 with, you know, 800 or, you know, whatever it is. Like it's, that's, that's, uh, that's the power of that. And it's so hard to picture it because in normal day-to-day -day life, you don't see that, you know what I mean? You don't see you don't see the impact of compounding. You don't even, you, you don't even feel it with inflation. Inflation feels bad in the moment, 
but on, only through the lens of the rear view mirror do you see exactly how bad it's been yeah right i mean when you start you guys are a lot older than me so i remember but easy he easy. finds a way to say that every just episode. so but, but i i my, what's the lowest gas price you remember I remember 79 cents a gallon. I remember getting gas. for. I'm talking about getting gas. I remember I'm not getting talking about gas. much. Wow. I don't think for me it was much less than that because I, um, I, uh, you know, gas prices, oh. well, g- g- gas prices held similar for a long, long, long time. I, don't, I got gas for like, I remember like 39 cents at Taco Bell. Oh, <laughs> come on, oh, man. There you go. There you go. He's here all week, folks. We, uh, uh, so we, I can't, I can't find it. Hold on a second. It's right here somewhere. There it there is. It is. Now, actually, I don't remember 79 cents. I was going to say, I remember just under a buck. So you're old. It was under you're a buck forever. Than, under a like buck when they had ever. to change it to, remember when they, when it went over a dollar for like the first broke, time consistently. They broke the buck. And they broke the <laughs> buck. I mean, and, and so now we all freak out when gas is four bucks. And gas is a terrible example because of the subsidies and, you know, all that other yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, Taxation but, um, and, you know, milk, you know, milk or eggs or, you know, stuff like milk's like five freaking dollars a gallon. You know, it's it's insane. But it used to be a buck. I mean, it used to be just take it off the cow. You know, <laughs> it cost anything. Oh, geez. Just, just sneak it. out in the field at 2 a.m. Yeah, maybe we're- it is. I get my, my milk for free. I get my Tip them over free. first and then milk them. You don't have to buy the cow when you get the milk for free. That's where that that's came ex- from. That's that. That's that's OG that created that. Created that phrase. That's, that's his that his his whole lesson. He brought. But to you the don't universe. you don't experience you know you don't experience the compounding effect of that. And what's what's really bizarre is you go yeah I understand that milk's five bucks a gallon and I understand that it used to be a dollar but no ways it can be worth is am I going to pay fifteen dollars a gallon in my lifetime it's like yeah you will sure will absolutely you will you know i mean car prices house prices the whole deal so um so we see it but we don't appreciate how it works with our money you know with our with 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 our investing so you know uh uh, that is that is one theme that's in here is this power of compounding And, and i like how Recent guests have really brought this up. Jonathan Clements, who used to be the personal finance columnist for the journal, uh, he said, oh, gee, it's much easier to get used to being frugal and living a Spartan lifestyle when you're young, like staying at the Red Roof Inn when you go places or camping, laying on the ground. And then four seasons later becomes way, way, way nicer than if you try to start with the four seasons when you're 20 years old and then go camping in your 40s. He, he said that, that's kind of a one-way street. Uh, and and Wes, Wes Moss's advice, if you remember from that roundtable discussion, Wes talked about how if he had to do over again, just those years between 20 and 30, work your butt off. Just work your, work your butt off. Because look, at if you're already in the $3 million train, by the time you're 30 years old, the rest of your life is going to be a lot, lot easier. That wasn't what really resonated with me about this piece, though, OG. The big thing that resonated was, and I think we'll probably hear this more from Manisha. Well, heck, I know that we'll hear this more from Manisha. And that's that the worries, the problems, the what am I going to do with my life every day? The money didn't solve that. There yeah. are th- there are several people in here who say, uh, uh, one gentleman who says every morning he asked himself what he'd do that day. I didn't like that feeling, said Wu whose wife died just after he retired, uh, retired in 2016. He missed work. So he started accepting assignments at his former practice. You know, all he's doing there is just filling his hours. And that's right. not healthy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, there's something very real about retiring to something instead of from something, you know, very, if, if very you don't, real. If, if, if you have been busy your whole life and you don't, and you don't have that busyness, um, you'll fill it with something. And you might fill it with sitting on the couch and eating, you know, bonbons or something. By the way, have you guys had bonbons before? No. no. It's, it's a worthy adversary. You like them? What is a bonbon? Like little teeny tiny ice cream balls. Oh, that's what. A, oh, yeah, I've had those. Yeah, you can <laughs> you can chisel through those like a package of those things in about 20 minutes. Yeah. Doug calls them ice cream balls, by the way. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, but, but, the, not the non-name brand version. I understand. Yeah, he doesn't use the highfalutin language. Uh, yeah. We will, we will, we will link to this um, in our show notes page because I think there's a lot here uh, to do with planning. By the way, it wasn't just Veronica Dagger. I apologize to Ann uh, Turgeson, who also we've uh, we've mentioned many times here in the show for her writing that wrote this piece. Good piece, and thanks to Doctor Bill for sending it. If you want to dive more into the topic of planning or investment allocation, well, the next day after each Monday, Wednesday episode, Kevin Bailey uh, writes our 201 newsletter, which dives even deeper. So head to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. It's filled with links to the best places that we found on the internet to explore this in even, even more detail. So we touch on a topic that you like during our show. We want to help you get uh, even deeper with the 201. StackingBenjamins.com slash 201. Manisha Takor is somebody who was making millions of dollars. Speaking of millions, OG, she was making millions and millions of dollars. She was running uh, separate accounts uh, for a big uh, money management firm. She actually created the accounts herself and grew it to be $5 billion. But she realized, even though she'd gone to all the right schools, she was around the right people, she'd worked on Wall Street, she'd been in investment banking, making all the money, she realized very early that this path was leading nowhere good. And we're going to hear her whole story. Uh, now she is... She's the leader of a of a space online called Money Zen, which is exactly I think what more of us need a little more more Money Zen. So I'm happy to talk to Manisha. But before that, Doug, I think you've got some trivia for us, man. Darn right I do, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I bet you didn't know that on this day in history, the symbol formerly known as the pound sign instantly transformed into what we know now as the hashtag when social technology expert Chris Messina used it to create groups on X, formerly known as Twitter. Launched as an experiment, the pound sign was added to the phrase bar camp, which is apparently not a real place where you go to slam hootie delights and kick ass at air hockey, but that got me thinking. Lots of celebrities have ditched their real names for completely made up ones. For those of you who still call it the pound sign, Jack Benny's real name was Benjamin Kubelski. And for listeners who've only known it as the hashtag Lady Gaga's legal name is Stefani Germanata. Although with celebrities naming their kids things like Pilot Inspector and XAsh A12, yeah, those are real. Lady Gaga wouldn't be the weirdest name to see in a birth certificate. This brings us to today's trivia. Which internationally beloved pop star changed his name to an unpronounceable symbol? I'll bat dance back with the answer right after I find out Joe's mom's former last name. I needed to answer a security question. Hey there, stackers. I'm former rotary phone user and guy who briefly thought of legally changing his full name to Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Apparently, there's a ton of work involved in legally changing your name and it costs money. Why would I do that when I can just hire some kid to Photoshop a new birth certificate for me? Maybe I can even get him to add that I was a freakishly tough baby. Fun fact, I cut my own cord and slapped my own ass. Anyway, today's trivia question was, which internationally beloved pop star changed his name to an unpronounceable symbol? The answer, Prince. The megastar cleverly changed his name to get out from under a recording contract with Warner Brothers Music, who had trademarked and taken ownership of his name. I gotta trademark my own name before someone steals it from me. And now, here to help us reimagine our relationship with work and money, it's Manisha Takor. I'm super happy she's coming down to the basement. Manisha Takor is here. How are you? Joe, I'm so excited to be here with you in the basement. <laughs> you haven't said that phrase often, have you? Uh, no, not since I was like, you know, in high school. <laughs> yeah, that, it that, was a, that was a whole different reason to be excited <laughs> That's right, yeah. hey uh you write manisha that at, at one point about this ceo who talks about how she starts her day about how she's up at 4 30 she does this meditation we could talk about what, who the ceo was later but I love those. When I was reading this in your book, I was thinking, I love these when I read these in Fast Company, like I hear about how Bob Iger starts his day, 
or how, you know, how these different CEOs, these great women and men do their thing. They're so addicting, but it's also maybe part of the problem of overworking. I have to ask you then, how do you start your day now that you've crossed this bridge? I am so excited that you asked me that question. I got out of bed this morning and I thought I am like the luckiest girl ever because I'm not going to check my phone. Instead, I'm going to go light a candle, make a cup of coffee, take my journal down to the dock. I happen to be on a lake right now in rural Maine and do some Julia Cameron morning pages, just free form journaling. So that's how I spent the first hour of my day. Um, and uh, it was just delightful to be out in nature and um, there was no productivity um, enhancement uh, associated with it whatsoever. Well, now it sounds like you're bragging about that the way that maybe you used to brag about the opposite, about incredible productivity. Joe, I'm busted, guilty. Um, I think, you know, human nature, it's a hard thing to combat. Yeah, you write, uh, you, you use a strong word. Manisha, to uh, to kick off this project, you use the word cult and you march into what you call this cult beginning in 1992 as a senior at uh, Wellesley College. What what happened? Because when somebody uses the word cult to kick off a book, I go, oh. Yeah, so I, I was very deliberate with that term because I felt as if I had been pulled into a sub world where the power was so intense and there was no questioning of a set of beliefs. And in this case, in this world that I was in, it was a notion that A, your self-worth uh, equals your net worth and B, that no matter what is ailing you, the solution is to do more, earn more, be more, 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 more. And so I, I literally felt like I had fallen into this horrendous thick space called the cult of never enough. And that, that cult that you're talking about specifically, you were going into investment banking? So the particulars of my life at that time were, yes, I had graduated from um, undergrad. I was heading into investment banking, which, you know, uh, a lot of things that we could say about that that I won't say on air. And then I was, went to business <laughs> school and I went back into um, the financial services world for the next 30 years. But what I, what I experienced, I think, is pretty universal for a group of people who have a propensity to... Um, not be able to disconnect from their work lives. Um, and so it's not industry specific. It's more of a, a psychological um, predisposition that can cause you to fall into the cult of never enough. But it's funny when you, when you started off, you got this early warning shot. So you're, you, you, you write that you're in the investment banking world. And when you went to quit, what, six or nine months in, like some early, early day, Manisha, you, you you go to quit and instead of saying, no, 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 stay with it, everybody's congratulating you. So already early on, you're getting these warning signs that while you're making money hand over fist, this might not be the right path. So that was one of the most impactful moments. Um, I, I'm 53 right now, and that must have happened when I was 23, 22. And I can remember it so vividly. So I go into the managing director's office to say, you know, yeah, thanks for spending six months training me and sending me over to London and letting me eat fancy dinners on your expense budget. But now I'm going to go quit and take a job that I uh, don't have to spend the night um, sleeping under my desk to complete. And the managing director, I uh, submitted my resignation to. And then two other very senior people came and said to me, like, Minisha, go you get out, get out of this world before your family becomes so used to this kind of money that you can't go anywhere else and you are trapped. And they were so clearly talking about their own lives, which on the outside looked so glamorous and um, exciting, but they were miserable. Um, and, and, you know, they'd gotten sucked into the cult of never enough. And I've never forgotten it. Unfortunately, I forgot to act on <laughs> the lesson. 
<laughs> well, that's what I was going to say, because if that was the indoctrination, you still fell into the hole, even though they warned you about it. You write then that uh, you're on an airplane, you're sitting in, I think you said like 2A or 2B, just in, and, and not first class because you have more room. You make it clear that, yes, while you have your laptop out and you've all kinds of papers and you're working furiously you're sitting up front so you can get off the plane as quickly as possible when this woman behind you who i guess you knew she walks up to you and she sees that you're clearly not in a great place tell us that story where you where now you're deeply in the cult of never enough oh yeah so uh, this is a, a super elegant um a female executive who I'd seen at various different industry gatherings, but we weren't friends. Um, but she saw me um, and she was coming back from a trip to the bathroom. And I mean, I just had tears just spilling from, you know, all over my face. I had papers everywhere. And I just, I had no idea at this point how I was going to make it through the next 48 hours of meetings I had scheduled. I was on a plane from Houston to New York. I was in the process of building out this, what ultimately ended up being a $6 billion separately managed account business. And I was just bone dry. Um, And she came up with this uh, dress to the nines, opened up this silver pill case and, and handed me a yellow tablet, actually three of them and said, take just a half of one to start. And I was so discombobulated. I didn't even ask what it was. I just took it and it actually really did help. Turned out it was Valium. Um, And that was uh, another pivotal moment when I started to realize how many people in financial services or other intense industries are so stressed out by the constant striving for more that we'll grasp onto anything to let us keep going rather than stop and question, why the heck am I living like this? What is it all for? Yeah, you, you, right. I'm going to quote you. Uh, Too many of us are suffering from a deeply rooted internal pressure to do more, earn more, achieve more, be more. And what's the result of all this achieving burnout, depression, loneliness, and a sense that no matter what we do, it's just, it's just, Never enough. I mean, for for you in particular, you go into other people, but I like continuing, Manisha, yeah. with your your very personal story, which is y- your parents even tried to intervene. You, yeah. You're you're going on. I I I actually laughed about this story because you every time your parents see you, you immediately go into look at how high my net worth is because my net worth equals my self worth, yeah. and your mom and dad are like, whoa, back up, which which is but the opposite of what you'd think a parent would do. Right. A parent's like, well, go, <laughs> and you, your parents are telling you to slow down. It, it's true. It's um, I would literally go through this ritual. I would go home at uh, at. Uh, the holiday time and it'd be December and I would hop in the car and I'd immediately start chattering a mile a minute, um, laying out what my bonus had been and, you know, uh, calculating, you know, what my new net worth was as a result of that. And my mom would constantly say, wait, wait, how are you? And I, you know, I'd be like, what do you mean? I'm telling you how I am. This is how much I earn. This is how much I'm worth. And you know, my parents kept trying to get me to understand that when you make money your God, you are putting yourself in a very hellish place. And um, I couldn't see it for the longest time until I ended up having the second of two near death health incidents, um, had destroyed my marriage, was divorced, um, had lost pretty much all of my friends because I was not responsive and and didn't ever put people's personal um, needs ahead of my professional ambitions. I I really was um, a very unpleasant human being. Is it it, it just, just how raw you've been about that, I think is, is so, I don't, I don't don't know if brave is the right word, but, but, but I just, I had such a pit in my stomach reading about your, uh, you know, especially the stuff about your marriage, because it felt like the ingredients were there. And yet you, you spent a lot of time ignoring them. You're, you're on a, you're on a motorbike and you're, you're going down the, uh, you're going down the Autobahn and your husband keeps nudging you. So you don't fall asleep and then kill both of you. In fact, he's in the hospital, not even talking about your health problems. He's in the hospital 
and he might have to have his leg amputated and you're so busy working. You're like, well, I'm so happy that you didn't have your leg amputated. Yeah. I mean, I look back at the, the person that I had become and it's horrifying to me. And, and that's part of the reason why I went on this whole journey was I wanted to understand um, I didn't grow up in a fancy pants household. I I don't live a fancy pants life now. Even when I was in the midst of all of that stuff, the stuff wasn't what 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 was driving me. It was this empty place that I was trying to fill in my soul. Mm. And um, like many people, I mistakenly tried to use money and accomplishments and titles to fill up that space of feeling un, un, deeply unworthy. Um, and so I went on this journey to try and understand how do people end up in this place where they feel it doesn't matter how much they earn, how many accomplishments they achieve, how much praise they receive. It's still not enough because you're not enough. And um, th that journey led me to hear so many powerful stories of other people who have landed in the same place. There's something in the zeitgeist right now, Joe, where so many of us are like, stop, oh, let's yeah. just stop. This is not living. Yeah. I don't know if it was the, if it was the pandemic or coming out of the pandemic and watching how quickly things ramp back up to where we were, the insanity of where we were before, after we had this mandatory pot, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I don't know what it is. And and I want to pivot to helping people solve this issue. Yeah. But before we do that, I know for a lot of our guests, Manisha, there's been a there's like a low point. There's a point where you're like, I can't do this anymore. Did you have this? Was there an epiphany day or was it just a realization uh, after so many bad things where you went, you know what, th th this has just got to change? I, I did have a one really big epiphany moment. Um, I'd like to be able to say I immediately transformed after that from the uh, person that um, uh, I was before, which was not a very good person. Um, the event was I was in the office. We had a prospective client coming in. She was very um, uh, private about her net worth. And we had a, the, the firm I was with at the time, we had an incredibly powerful onboarding process. And I wanted her to see how powerful it was, but you needed to have numbers and a story to go along with it. So um, I had my colleagues interview me as if I were the prospective client and put my financials up on the screen. And as I'm walking through the story of how I earned the money that I had, and, you know, realizing that we could run the Monte Carlo six ways to Sunday. And because I'm not a fancy pants person, it doesn't take me a lot of money to live that I'm there. I'm there. And yet I've not been living at all. And it was this wake up moment, realizing that I'd spent the entirety of my adult life as a human doing. I'd never experienced life as a human being. And for what? And so that coincided with um, my body uh, starting to attack itself, autoimmune issue, and I got very, very ill, and I was on bed rest for um, almost nine months. And so I had a lot of time to think about that meeting, and it was the combination of literally my body shutting down um, and this realization swirling around, you know, like neon lights for what? For what? For what? For what did I strive after all of this financial health, wealth, whatever you want to call it? Because I am emotionally bankrupt. It's amazing. You you also point out that while this is not this is a huge moment for you. It also you're not the only one who had a moment like that. You write on a Sunday afternoon, April 2021, a 45 year old financial consultant in London named. Jonathan Frostick, I think is how you pronounce it, sat down at his home office desk to get some work done. Suddenly his chest tightened and his ears popped. He's in the throes of a heart attack and he knew it. But his first thought, his first thought was, I need to meet with my manager tomorrow and this is inconvenient. Like that's, it sounds like you had nine months of that, of that, of that same thought. In fact, I want to ask you because, because you make a point of this, the fire movement, a lot of great stuff around financial wellness you yeah. even write, Manisha, in, in, in the book that a lot of people in the fire movement may be doing this wrong, where it's now become a race to the bottom. Like, yeah. how quickly can I have more? How, I guess, is it is it right to say, how can I have more or less? 
Like, how can I cheapen my life so much that everybody high fives me that I'm the cheapest person on earth? Right. It's, you know, what I, um, you know, and I love the fire movement. I, I, um, for the vast majority of my career, I um, saved a huge proportion of what I was um, earning primarily because I was working all the time, so I couldn't spend it. But I lived a very <laughs> fire type lifestyle with a fire type mentality. I wanted to hit that crossover point where I didn't have to work. I, I was working because I wanted to. Um, for the book, I interviewed Vicki Robin, um, you know, the grandmother of the fire movement who I adore. And, and Vicki was so awesome. Oh, isn't she? I, I, if anyone's listening and they haven't yet read Your Money or Your Life, you must read it. it it's amazing. And she was telling me that, you know, her when she and Joe Dominguez originally wrote the book, the idea was to inspire people to live lightly on the planet. But part of that was live, you know, not just uh, yeah. uh, compete and, and chip away and try and get your expenses as low as possible, but to live fully as a human and connect with each other and connect with community and give. And, um, and that that living part oftentimes gets lost um, as we tighten um, our, our, uh, our numbers as we're working through our fire analysis. You know, uh, you make it clear is where we're going to start, start helping people solve their workaholic problems, our stacker community, if they have it. And I know that we all do. And I love that you said earlier that, um, you know, this isn't going to be a, I'm not going to all of a sudden wake up tomorrow and be a different person. So this will be a process, but you, you you start off by sharpening the knife and, carving a difference between two different things, money problems and money worries. You're not talking about money problems here. You're talking about money worries, I think. Correct. I define money problems as things with an intellectual answer. My credit court, my credit score stinks. What do I do about it? I don't know how much house can I afford? Help me figure that out. Money worries are, are solved at an emotional level. And they were there. There are no five tips to to resolve a money worry. It requires um, an honestly an interdisciplinary soul searching um, to get to the root of them, and that's why they are so painful and so prevalent. And we don't like to talk about them. I, well, I think that's why the 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 concept of your brand Zen. Is so because Zen is much more of a journey toward, you know, it's this uh, versus perfection right away. As mom says, progress, not perfection, Joe. Come on. Uh, but <laughs> the, the Buddhists, you write, call this the realm of the hungry ghost. What is the realm of the hungry ghost? Oh, so the hungry ghost is this concept that walking amongst us are individuals who are so hungry for love Um caring, um, a feeling of belonging, yet no matter how much of that they receive, they never feel nourished because their throats are as small as a needle. So no much how much love is coming at them or wonderful things in life, they're not able to absorb it and they're always hungry. And that's a metaphor for what I see so many people struggling with. And, um, I, I like that concept because it points out that this is not necessarily a modern problem. It may be on steroids now, but um, it is yeah. something that we've struggled with throughout the ages. How much is enough? Okay, I have a I have a question, and people, our stackers might scream at their device uh, that I'm a moron by even asking this. But have you seen the Studio Ghibli movies, like Spirited Away? Have you seen these movies? No, I remember I'm new to living. So, um, is this something I should? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're fantastic. If you like these weird, uh, fantastic Japanese, um, uh, wonderful. I, I mean, they they have won so many awards, but the movies, Manisha, are so weird. But there is a character in a lot of these movies who is a he's a figure that appears, and he has like a white mask. Is 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 that the hungry ghost? Yes, that, that, yes, yes. I got it. I, all right. All right. And I've, I've got half of my audience going, I have no idea what you're talking about. The other half going, you're an idiot. Of course, that's Hungry Ghost, Joe. I, I, I didn't know. But um, let me ask you this. So 
on one hand, we got this aspiration, right? That you, you were on this train, you grew this division to $6 billion, and yet you still didn't feel like there was enough. But on the other side, you've got this, you know, p- part of the fire movement is I reject that train. I'm going to get off that train and I'm going to begin living this life. Is there a middle ground where you can still aspire to career heights and not be in this cult of never enough? I truly believe there is, but but it's not easy in modern society to get there. And I think the way many of us know um, Carl Richards, um, the sketch guy from the New sure. York Times for so many years, and his iconic drawing is of these two concentric circles. And one says what's important, and the other says what can be controlled. And what you should focus on is the intersection of those two. And I think what's happened in modern life is we are just drowning in, in busyness. And so for most of us, if we are able to take a look at our to-do list in using kind of Carl's rubric, and we say, like, what really matters to me and what do I absolutely have to get done because it's just essential to living and scrape out everything else that's in the middle, then you've got a life where you are moving forward, growing personally, flourishing professionally, but you're not on the runaway train of feeling like you can never get there. And... uh, The thing that struck me the most as I was trying to figure out how can you thread that needle, the the magic word is uh, disconnection. What, What academics have observed is the people who tend to be super, quote unquote, successful are the, and I mean that in a broad context of like living a rich life, like Ramit Sethi, rich life. Um, concept. Yeah, yeah. They, they are able to disconnect when they are not doing their hard work, their deep work. And so that's the secret ingredient. It's the ability to um, go after your goals, but n- not have them stuck in your head floating around when you're off doing things with your kids or your friends, or you're just with yourself. And that to me is, um, has become the magic key disconnection. And that's, I think how you get to that idyllic state you were describing. Well, no, and that's what I wanted to ask next is for our stackers beginning this journey. Where do we begin? Where do we start walking this different path? How do we begin to find really, I think internally more of ourself and less of what we think about ourselves as, as, as not enough. I think there are two components to this. The first is an overarching framework. Um, I realized that I was living my life quite literally to optimize the equation, self-worth equals net worth. And that led to a, a variety of exceptionally toxic beliefs and behaviors. And so from a big picture standpoint, what what I'm encouraging people to do is identify what that item is on the other side of the equal sign. Self-worth equals what? Is there some kind of negative connotation um, or equation that's walk, that you're walking around with? And if it, there is, what can you replace it with? And my suggestion is considering using the framework of financial health plus emotional wealth equals money zen. In other words, that those of us who love personal finance and, and believe in the fire movement, we, we, we work on and we invest in our financial health, but we often don't invest in our emotional wealth. And what studies have now shown is that the reason, you know, money can't make you happy is over the long run, once you've met your basic Maslow hierarchy of the need needs, um, if you don't have a basis of emotional well-being, incremental money um, uh, beyond a certain point, and that certain point differs for everyone, does not add to your life satisfaction. So step one of this whole journey is identifying, are you optimizing, are you living your life to optimize a toxic equation? If so, what what might that be? And, you know, some people I talk to with self-worth, you know, yoga instructors, the number of students in my class, um, academics, the number of published papers I have and how many times they're cited. So a lot of different ways that can play out, but it's replacing that negative equation with this very flexible, 
positive equation. So now whenever you're making choices about what to do with your limited resources of time and money, you, you can ask, is this helping to nourish my financial health? Is this helping to nourish my emotional wealth? Um, and how do I want to asset allocate between those two buckets? You know, it's it's funny. There's this uh, bubbling under the surface, and I don't know that I that I actually read this in the text of your book, but it felt like as you're talking about redefining, there there has to be this this uh, almost more time of celebration of 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 what is now versus what I'm striving for. Do you know what I'm? Do, do you know what I'm getting at? Like, I need to spend a little more time celebrating the the, the brilliant thing I am versus this thing that I hope I am, you know, where the horizon is, uh, which I never am going to reach. Yeah, I mean, it's just that concept um, of, you know, uh, planning for the future, but living in the present. And so many of us don't, right? It's, yeah. we, we plan for the future and we live in the future. And part of that is that I truly believe we are so busy these days. I call it wearing busy badges that we've, we've gotten to the point where we revere the state of busyness and we place more value on people who are busy. And, you know, when, when you greet each other, how are you doing? Oh, good. Busy, super busy, crazy, busy, yeah. really busy. <laughs> and you know, like that's nuts. Like who wants to live a life like that? Yet yeah, that's what most of us, are are doing and as a, uh, one woman I talked to said, you know, no one ever answers that question of how are you doing with great. I just finished a pan of brownies and watched the entire season of Shit's Creek. Um, like nobody wants to admit that they you know <laughs> just kicked back and you know. So to your point, we don't celebrate these glorious small moments that are present in all of our days because we're speeding past them. We don't even notice that they're there. And so slowing down and um, I mean, for me, two guiding principles of my life um, are now simplicity and small joys. And um, I use this as kind of North stars for my day. And it's amazing the, the different places I'm able to find joy now that I've given myself what I call permission to achieve less. I think that's actually a great place to leave it. There's a there's a comedian who who died maybe a year and a half ago, uh, Manisha. And and again, you probably won't even know this reference because, like we said, you just started living. <laughs> but 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 her, but her name was Jeannie Robertson, and she talked about how there was she was this brilliant comedian from North Carolina, and she would talk about how there's funny all around us. We just never look for it, and then all of yeah. her. All of her comedy was this observational humor around just being in the moment. And I think what appealed to many of us about her was not was not so much the har 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 comedy, but the fact that she was living in the moment and finding these things that we all overlook, which I thought was was just absolutely, absolutely brilliant. You talk about you talk about connection that most of us are, you know, there's a lot of us that are chasing stuff that are lonely connection, creativity, and authenticity. But I really want to talk about connection. A lot of us really struggle with connection. Is there a way for us to kind of begin on that bandwagon? Yes, this was one of the biggest lessons I learned in my research was um, a, a, a concept from um, a, an expert named Mary Laverde who she says, when you feel discombobulated about anything in life, ask yourself, to whom or what do I need to connect right now in order to move just incrementally more towards a state of happiness or, or contentment? And so, you know, the answer to that question may be, I need to go take five deep breaths or I need to go to bed early tonight, or it may be I need to get divorced or change my job. I mean, sometimes the answers can be really big, but it's this notion that connection is what creates balance in our life. And we are so out of balance because we're not connected to ourselves, to each other, to the broader community and something bigger than ourselves, however you think about that. And the 
idea of becoming connected, I mean, for me, it was terrifying. I, I used work to keep people at bay. I, I had had some, um, I talk about it in the, the, the book, some childhood um, bullying incidences, which just left me with this gaping hole of feeling unworthy and unwanted. And so I, I use busyness to keep um, that pain away. And so I lost my connection muscles. And so as you're building them back, this, this phrase to whom or what do I need to connect is a wonderful way to start learning connection, but also to do exactly what you said earlier, Joe, which is experience the moment. Because that small step typically is something that will light up the current moment for you. The book is Money Zen, The Secret to Finding Your Enough. Obviously, this is a book that resonated with me. It's a project. Uh, uh, w w well, Manish, all your work lately has resonated with me like from, from afar. And just this idea of finding connection is, I think, so important and so needed. Thanks for helping our stackers today get a little bit more connected. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for letting me come on and get connected with you. Huge thanks to Manisha. And and OG, what a what a horrible story when your when your parents ask you how you're doing and all you can tell them is how many zeros is in your net worth as proof that you're doing well because you have no other life. I mean, don't get me wrong, lots of money, better than having not enough money, but still, when you're popping pills on an airplane, you got no idea what the pills are that you're taking just because somebody hand them to you and you thought you'd feel better. Might be time to, time to, to change. Time to take a, uh, take a step back. Yeah. Do you, do you see that often when you meet with people, people that are just, because there was one type of person that always drove me crazy when I was a planner. And it was the person who, you could tell they were just looking for this perfect strategy they were never going to find. And they just were sure it was out there. So it was going to be, they were on this treadmill of, oh, no, 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 there's got to be something. No, 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 there's something hidden that I, there's something you're not telling, there's something out there that is this thing that I should be doing with my money that I'm not. I wonder if it's the sense of urgency that we're all given by all the stuff we read. That we feel like we need to have that, that whatever that end number is, 3.6 or 5 or 1, whatever, whatever the end number it should be. If we, are, if this goes back to something OG was talking about earlier in the show, or we just don't have that patience. But if we, if we can be patient and just let compounding interest work, I remember when we were saving for college, I, uh, and my oldest was like a freshman in high school. And I thought, oh, we're never going to get there. It's four years away. I'm never going to make it. And it's amazing what happened in those four years. Now, were, were we fortunate with some market increases? Sure. But that's happening right now, too. And we know that happens very cyclically and not necessarily predictably, but but cyclically. And it's just I think those clients that come into uh, planners offices and feel like we need to have this hit that number in two years. Is that okay. it, or is it just a compulsion, OG? Well, I'm not a psychiatrist, although I play one on TV. I think I think that um, I think that it's it's not only it's not only those things, Doug, but also the uh, Joe. You've said this: the you know, make, trying to make perfect the enemy of good. You know, mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of conversations with people. You know, we do we do full plan reviews at the beginning of the year. That's just kind of how we have things set up. And, and then we, at the halfway point throughout the year, we'll kind of check in and see how things are going. And quite often it's like, well, how are we doing? We, you know, it's like this, that, like you said, you use words compulsion. I don't think that's the right word, but, but, uh, this anxiety around like, well, I know I was okay in May and that, but now it's October. So how are we? It's like, well, nothing, nothing's going to change that drastically in that we're looking for trends and patterns and you know, and that sort of thing in a six month time horizon, you know, you're not going to go off the rails, you know, in, in, in a, in a five month window, probably not. Right. Like in, and, and, and if you did, you'll, you'll see it long before, you know, your advisor would, cause you'll be like, Oh crap, I've got 40 grand of credit card debt all of a sudden or something. You know what I mean? But the market's not going to have that big of an influence over that short period of time. And, and the only thing that you can do is blow it up on your own, which is unlikely. And I think the also the, the the recognition from a planning standpoint that 
you know, whether your plan says you're 85% covered or 91% covered or 82% covered, like whatever percentage, like it's such a shot in the dark in 30 years from now that you're just trying to point the ship in the right direction. You know what I mean? Like you can do all the math you want to your point about uh, doubling every nine years. Well, that requires an 8% return, right? Well, what if you get 7.9? Well, it's not going to double every nine years then. You know what I mean? Like, like we're, we're, we're basing assumptions based on, you know, long-term numbers over, over a long period of time, but there are hiccups that can happen along the way. And I think what, what planning is designed to do is to identify where you're starting to drift off a little bit, right? Where you're starting to kind of follow a little bit of a different path so that you can course correct. It's not necessarily to set a plan up when you're 30 years old and go, oh, I only have to do these three things. And then by 65, I'll be set. I mean, that might happen, but it's much more about the activity of like sitting down and thinking about your money. Joe, you talk about your, you know, month or weekly meeting with Cheryl, right? Like you're not, you're not radically changing your strategy every week. You're going, hey, are we still pointing in the right direction? You know what I mean? It's not about, it's the activity of having that conversation. It's not, it's not the, hell, we had that conversation six years ago, so I know we're good. You know, it's, it's the, uh, it's the value of the conversation, not necessarily. Hold up. Joe, you get a weekly meeting with Cheryl at your age? Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> wow. I mean, there are a lot of marriages who don't have that kind of spice in it for a weekly meeting. Impressive, well, they, he man. He talks about it all the time. They have pancakes, wow. or, pancakes or wine, I guess. I don't know. Pancakes or wine. It's kind of kinky. Um, yes. We uh, pull out the spreadsheets. Doug, we're freaks in the spreadsheets <laughs> together. <laughs> to, to quote, that's that's an Emily Guy Birkin joke. Uh, my co-author of Stacks, she she did that one first, but that's that's pretty good stuff. Hey guys, uh, let's throw out Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency OG, they put what you value first. Uh, what do I value first right now? Um, I I'm really enjoying this uh, cold front that we had come through here in Dallas. Oh, it's it was so a, great. It was so a, great. Uh, it was 68 degrees this morning. It was, um, wow. It was great. I mean, it's I didn't a, feel like I was accidentally swimming during my run yesterday morning. <laughs> Last night, uh, Cheryl and I went on like a, a couple mile walk. That was just, yeah. it was beautiful. Yeah. Low, low humidity. And you know, it was, it was only 95 yesterday. It's only gonna be 96 today. I mean, tomorrow it's gonna be 108 again, but, but that's hey, enjoy fall that's today. Right, right. I'm looking at the numbers for while everybody's listening to this, and and the numbers are well over a hundred again. Uh, yeah, while yeah, we're for, in Colorado for now until Christmas. But yes, today was a nice treat. It was great. Well, it is your loved ones and your time, uh, but it should be your loved ones, your time, and cool weather. That's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. Their application, it's all simple. It's all online. You get an instant coverage decision so you can spend more time outside. Their prices are affordable and all policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than 160 years old. You know, you got to do it. You know, if your life insurance in order, just pause the show right now. Stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life. Today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to uh, somebody whose parents called him anonymous. Imagine if your parents named you anonymous. That's a. Uh, that's quite a, quite a moniker. Thanks, mom and dad. Hey, Joe and OG. I guess Doug, the real talent of the show. I'll be separating from the military in about a year, and I started planning for our housing after our move. Due to life constraints, e.g. the wife can't stop bringing home stray animals, we'll likely be buying and not renting again. We currently own a home at a juicy 2.75% with a VA mortgage. I'm going to miss that part and plan on selling this home as we have no desire to be landlords. We'll also have an opportunity to use a physician loan on moving and could, with the equity built up from COVID, pretty easily have a 20% down payment if needed. My question is, how would you recommend choosing or utilizing our different mortgage options? While researching, it looks like each option has a benefit. I have no clue what my disability rating might be if we do a VA loan and do not fully understand the process for buying as we sell our current home. Any tips would be appreciated. Oh, and are there any limits on how many of those sweet shirts someone can get? Asking for a friend, of course. <laughs> I see what he's doing there. 
Hey, thanks for that question. And uh, also thank you for your service. And um, man, big transition in somebody's life coming up here, OG, uh, transitioning out of the military. It's be an interesting uh, case study, I think, because of all of the uh, radical changes in interest rates and kind of how that's affecting the housing market and that sort of stuff. Um, I know uh, in our neighborhood, for example, there were a couple homes that went for sale very quickly were snatched up and now they're both back listed for sale again. And I'm, I'm wondering if uh, everybody is in the back of their mind using, you know, old, old rates in their, you know, to calculate like, Oh, I can make that payment. And then, and then, and then you get to the bank and you go, what do you mean? 7%. What, what is that? You know, I think that's a, I mean, it's such a huge difference in terms of, in terms of cost structure uh for that principal and interest and and i know all the realtors in the room are yelling you know you 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 buy the house you rent the rate you know that's kind of their that's their uh rallying cry right now to kind of uh, get some deals done but um but i think that's probably the biggest shock that's going to happen is that the affordability is going to change quite a bit you know what you're used to right now in terms of the loan balance and the payment and the interest rate and and how much you're seeing that principal go down every month and all that sort of stuff is going to be radically different. Um, you're right. Being a uh, veteran, uh, active duty, uh, retired service member, there's a number of different options, you know, from a, from a, a housing standpoint, everything from a regular conventional loan, of course, to, to utilizing some of the veterans benefits. I think the best option is to use, is to work with a counselor who has the ability to offer all of those things. You know, if you waltz into your local uh, Fortune 50 bank branch, the likelihood of running into a mortgage broker who specializes in working with service members who are separating or have recently is pretty low. And, and I think this is a great idea or a great option is to use one of the major companies that's, that work with service members, of course, and we're quite partial to Navy Federal, and uh, and I used them on a on a uh, house purchase seven eight months ago, and it was fairly smooth. Um, and that's kind of I think that's where I would start is is use a professional mortgage person who has the resources to be able to uh, to offer all the different services, you know, or all the different loan options and. And it's not just even the loan options, it's the moving, it's the, it's the insurance rates, it's the, you know, it's like all of those things that kind of go into that, into that uh, house buying thing. House buying I think process. that is the, I think that's the key to this question that widens it for everybody. I mean, not, not uh, a ton of our listeners who are going through exactly what uh, he's going through right now, but the, but the key to this answer, if we think about how we think and it's not ask how to get it done, ask who can can help you with this. And clearly, OG, when you're transitioning out of the military, there are there are plenty of organizations and uh, counselors who have uh, who who get involved there. Um, I know that working both with Navy Federal and in the past with the USAA, just knowing that the that the the number of um, military sponsored organizations, government sponsored organizations that can help out um, and can give him good counseling on what's available to him that isn't available to other people is huge. But even if it's not this, even if it's, hey, you know, I've got, I've got this small business. How do I do my taxes right? Wrong question. I own this small business. Who knows about small business taxes that can help me look yeah. and you'll get you'll get a faster answer you'll get a better answer and you won't end up in the weeds on youtube videos <laughs> that, that may or may not help you with your situation definitely definitely a who not how problem that's right yep yeah good stuff uh thanks for the question if you've got a question for us and i hope I hope I'll have to ask Karen, but I hope that he left us. He did not leave us his name, but he he did uh, hopefully leave us his uh, address so we can send him a Haven Life, a Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt. And uh, we limit it to one, Anonymous. We limit it to one and we're sending it to you. And um, if you have a significant other, I've noticed they tend to steal them because they're very comfortable. 
Yeah, I think he was trying to indicate that I'm his significant other. Oh, it well, pretty clear that's where he was headed. He, that's not how I heard it, but okay. I, 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 I don't know that. I think you inferred a lot there. But stackybenjamins.com slash uh, voicemail, and we are happy to answer your question. Hey, on to, uh, just before we say goodbye, our community calendar. You know, OG, we had a lot of people, a lot of people either write us or post in the basement about our episode a couple Fridays ago. It was episode 1391, which was called Fortune Favors the Prepared, and it was about these uh these recent we've had two over one billion dollar powerballs in a row now oh gee and the thing that people wanted to comment on and i was really glad to see this people wanted to comment on the fact that we did not talk at all about serving your community we talked about how to invest it but we didn't talk about the bigger picture and i really like that and frankly from my perspective as a guy leading that discussion we just ran out of time like we were we had so much stuff going on and that was uh, cut on the chopping block at the end of that episode. But what a what a what a great uh, commentary from our stacker community that when you win a billion dollars, it's not about you anymore, OG. It's about serving other people as well. Oh. Not for you. <laughs> you find a way to spend it. <laughs> Well, I guess there's a reason why three of us didn't come up with that. <laughs> the fourth one may have had a had a had a different motive, but but clearly at a billion dollars, OG, you're thinking bigger. No, oh, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of good that can be done. I think as I think back on that episode, I um, I'm thinking that we were really working on the like the first you know 30 days of like. Well, what 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 literally do I have to do in the next thirty days? You know, what, and it's and that's true not just for you know winning the Powerball, but 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 any you know any sort of any sort of uh, financial uh, windfall, whether a big bonus at work or or um, you know an inheritance of some kind or something something like that, a stock option grant vests, and all of a sudden you know a company went public, you weren't thinking it was going to happen, and poof, I've got all this money. It's, uh, I don't think, I don't think very many people are immediately going, I need to give some of this to charity. It's like, well, no, I got to talk to the CPA. I've got to, you know, all the stuff that we mentioned. So, but yes, yeah. that is one of those things. It is, it is better. I, I have found though, that those, you know, those hedonistic kind of sugar goals of, Hey, I'll travel more. Or we talked about the woman who got a, a couple hundred thousand dollars from her stepdad. You know, he won the lottery and gave the couple hundred thousand dollars. She was just going to fix up her house and take her family on vacation. Those, those, those don't last a lifetime. And maybe part of the reason why so many people that win the lottery go broke later on. But thanks for all of your interest in that. And for all of the notes, thanks to Bill, by the way, for sending us uh, uh, today's headline. That was great. And by the way, we've been mentioning some of the stackers and I realized that there's a bunch of stackers also who have shown us that they're wearing swag all over the place. Uh, uh, we had uh, Daniel, and by the way, these are in high profile areas, uh, big time brands getting a taste of what uh, the stacker community is all about. Daniel was at the Guinness Experience and took a picture wearing his uh, Stacking Benjamins shirt as uh, he's showing the people at Guinness what maybe a real organization works like. You know, not that Johnny come lately Guinness or uh, Jason, who was getting his nerd on at, at Gen Con, repping the brand for all the other board game nerds at Gen Con and uh, John and Nikki, who are both showing off uh, Doug. They're showing off uh, the early, early campaign shirts for 2024. Love it. Everybody else is in Iowa. We've, we, we just, we're sending John and Nikki out on the road with the message. Ohio is a swing state, man. You got to get Ohio. So I'm, that's where I'm focusing. Well, Nikki's in Ohio and John is in, uh, is in Washington state. So we know we got a couple votes in those, in those states. Thanks to uh, Eastern Washington. I always think, you know, I don't know why I think backwards. Those are two states. It's like Colorado. Eastern yes. Washington and Western Washington are like two separate Totally states. different places. Yeah. 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 He's in Eastern Washington. But anyway, thanks to all those stackers. And if uh, 
if you uh, want to show the world your stacker pride, uh, snap a shot and we'll mention you on the show. All right. And by the way, if you want to get some stacker pride, stackybenjamins.com slash shirts, and you'll find all the different uh, cool, cool designs that uh, Brad, our designer at Flying Port Productions in Cincinnati, as uh, what wasn't that, Doug, how Ernie Harwell used to say it? Cincinnati. Right. He did. Cincinnati, Ohio. All right. That's going to do it for today, except uh, one more thing, guys. And that is that if you are here, not because you're looking for Stacky Benjamin swag or because of the fact that you uh, you wanted to hear Manisha's amazing story, you're here because you feel like you need to put together a better team to work on your planning. OG and his team are taking clients and to get on their calendar, you go to stackybenjamins.com slash OG. We are now headed into September. And I know when the September train hits OG, uh, not long from now, you're going to be telling me you're done uh, with these meetings for the rest of the year. Getting close. I mean, we usually wrap it up around uh, Halloween because you know, at the end of the year, it gets a little busy and everybody, you know, we're trying to, trying to, um, trying to, uh, finish up all the last year end bits, uh, to make sure everything gets, uh, all the I's are dotted, so to speak. So, so yeah, just, uh, just a few more months. Right. So make sure that OG gets to work on your bits. That might not be, might, might not be the, might not be the tagline we're looking for. Stackingbenjamins.com <laughs> slash OG. I might get a talking to uh, from OG about that later. All right. That's going to do it for today. Uh, except lots of takeaways, Doug. But what do you think? Uh, what are our top three? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from Manisha to core and don't let yourself get trapped in the maddening mindset of always needing more, more, more. Second, and maybe part two of the first one, a $5 million retirement lifestyle? That still doesn't take away all the worries that retirement will bring. So don't just save, plan. But the big lesson, I just figured out it is much easier to legally change your name if you get into the Witness Protection Program. So look, if you guys don't start treating me with a little respect, I will sell you up the river in a heartbeat. Thanks to Manisha Takor for joining us today. You can find out more about her work at moneyzen.com. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lisa Curry, who's also the host of the Long Story Long podcast, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Wonder how beautiful we all are? Of course, you'll never know if you don't check out our YouTube version of this show, engineered by Tina Eichenberg. Then you'll see once and for all that I'm the best thing that ever happened to this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Of course you do. Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Youngkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Did you watch that? You guys watch that golf show on Netflix? Full swing. Yeah. Full swing. Yeah. 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 I liked it. But, um, but OG, you were telling a story about uh, Dustin Johnson and he was on that. And I don't, 
I don't think that I don't think that show made Dustin Johnson look good. I thought I got no, done like a lot of guys. A lot, no, a lot of guys. I got done watching that and I'm like, you're pretty cool. Like the guy who's really relaxed. There was a golfer who's really relaxed, maybe Jeff overly Hurley. relaxed. And everybody else thought he was could be better if he took himself more seriously. And then he ends up uh, just rocking. Um, I didn't watch the entire thing, but I but I. Uh... I didn't get through all of it yet, but yeah, there are some, there, there's some players in there that yes, you, you like, and then there's some on the other side that you're like, ah, which is sure. funny. Cause Dustin Johnson went to live golf. And at the time that was this big deal, right? That the Saudis are creating this thing and that you can buy, you know, you can buy golf. And so that was a big, huge deal. He looked horrible and yet they showed Ian Poulter doing the same thing. And I came away watching Ian Poulter and I went, okay, yeah, I get why he'd do this. Yeah. Yeah. But Justin Don Johnson, Dustin Johnson, I got done watching him do it. I'm like, dude, you're a loser. <laughs> of course he could be a loser with millions of dollars and, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, I care a lot. A, what you think? Or yeah, and, a, think. and a Gretzky is your spouse and right. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, with Poulter, he just seemed to be in the sunset of his golfing career. And so you think, yeah, man, I mean, if you have a chance at the tail end, you're you're not really tearing up the the main tour. and You got a chance to go do that for your family. That's just providing. Absolutely. Go do it. it. Totally seemed like it. He's like, yeah. yes, I am. Funny because, in. Yes. You know, you look at you look at uh, any other sport. Right. And an athlete does it. I mean, what did uh, LeBron do, right? Like he was a Cleveland guy and then went, now nah, I'm going to Miami. And everybody was mad for a year and they went, now nah, we get it. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's providing for his family. You know, he's, he's building his kind of legacy. And then he went to, you know, Shaq did it. He got drafted by Orlando, right? And then, and then he leaves and goes to wherever he ended up going next to the Heat, Lakers. And then, and then to the Lakers, right? And it's like, it's like, no, that was a good business decision, right? You know, you watch the baseball guys that move around or hockey guys that move around. It's always a good business decision for those guys. But with the golfers did it. It was like, whoa, 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 man, you're taking the pure sport and turning it into a business, man. That's not cool. Well, it's not that. It's also the Saudi part about human rights there. A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, but to your point about LeBron, I still hated the fact that LeBron James did it for a long time until I read a great biography, fantastic biography called LeBron Inc., which was recommended to me by uh, Talat McNeely from His and Her Money. And I said, OK, I'm not a big fan of LeBron. That book is really good. What I really liked about it was that LeBron gave this guy from the Cleveland Plain Dealer the, the ability to write the book and said, I am not going to second guess you. You go ahead and write whatever you want to write. And the guy writes that right at the beginning. I just got to tell you, this is LeBron did participate, but he also gave me the ability to just, just, I get the final cut. I get the final say. And what's cool about it is that it goes over all the stuff that LeBron effed up, just completely messed up and how he rebounded from it, which I found LeBron way more Seems compelling. Better. What's that? What's that? Oh, he rebounded. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't even catch that. Ah. See, that, that's he when you dribbled into his decision making, and then and then rebounded <laughs> and dunked it. His success. I thought he. I thought he created a personal foul, but came back and and shoots the three in overtime for the win. Football. No, yeah, it, it was. It was. It was. It was fantastic. I can recommend LeBron Inc. But 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 to your point, OG, I did still feel. Like, yeah, and, and I saw Doug's face like, yeah, no, when he left a little Cleveland, bit. Yeah, I mean, no. but the second time he did it, when he went from Miami to L.A., did anybody care? No, the seal was broken at that point. Wait a minute. He exactly. went Miami back to Cleveland. Yeah, Matt oh, Miami back right. to Cleveland. He went back and to then Cleveland. and then to L.A. <clears throat> well, yeah. And at the end of your career, too, it is the kind of Ian Poulter thing. You're like, OK, you're you know, it's the sunset of your career. You're going to play at this place where Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played, where Magic Johnson played, where. You know, Shaq played where all these 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 greats played. Kobe Kurt Rambis. Yeah, Kurt Rambis. My fa my favorite whenever I think of the uh of the LeBron, the first time he left Cleveland, uh, I was uh working at Quicken 
and in Detroit. Oh yeah. And in the, the owner's company. Yeah. So Dan Gilbert owned lo- the lo- majority owner of Quicken, uh, now Rocket, and uh, and obviously owned the Cavs. And there is a huge fish tank as you enter the executive area, senior executive area of Quicken, huge fish tank right in front of you as the glass doors open. And uh, in the fish tank was a LeBron bobblehead and a Dwayne Wade bobblehead. <laughs> Because once LeBron left, he was dead to Dan Gilbert. <laughs> and so he puts LeBron in the fish tank. And he's, he's you swimming see with the, the fish, like, pecking at his face to get whatever the growth is. Oh, it's hilarious. So good. Fabulous. <laughs>